We're talking with Dr. Ira Bayak, director of the Palliative Care Program at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, about how his program cares for people with advanced illnesses. I'm Ira Bayak. I'm a practicing physician, and I have the privilege of directing the Palliative Care Program here at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. So what exactly is palliative care? A lot of people ask that question. Uh, palliative care is a new discipline. Well, we represent a team approach to caring for people with uh, advanced illness, usually life-threatening illness, uh, and their families. We address physical, emotional, social, and even spiritual needs, and seek to support people and enhance their quality of life while living with illness, them and their families. How does that differ from, from hospice, which is what some people are familiar with? Sure, so in the United States, palliative care actually grew out of the hospice movement. But whereas hospice really is focused solely on people at the end of life, and under Medicare really requires people to acknowledge that they are facing the end of life, palliative care brings the same knowledge base and skill set of hospice care into an earlier part of illness, often while people are in active phases of treating disease. So it's before they're at the end stages, so to speak. Most of the time we're asked to see people who are uh, quite a bit before uh, a phase of life we would call dying. Uh, sometimes not, but you know we see um, illness as a continuum and we're there in a truly patient and family-centered way to support people, often helping them get through very difficult courses of treatment, sometimes in the ICU or sometimes congestive heart failure treatments, sometimes cancer treatments, but we're, we stick with them and support them and their family whatever the course happens, celebrating with them uh, if things get better and, they, and the disease uh, is, goes into remission or is controlled, but also following them and supporting them through these very difficult but frankly normal stages of life that include the, the phase of life we call dying. In terms of the things you hear from patients themselves or from their family members, what sort of differences do you hear that your group has made in the lives of those patients? Well, it's, you know, it's such a pleasure to, to practice here and to do this work because we meet people uh, often when they're feeling as, as vulnerable and scared and, and really uncomfortable as they've ever been in their lives. And we bring, the, frankly, the power of, of medicine and nursing treatments uh, with all the bells and whistles that, that we have to bear, the pharmacology and the physiologic tools that we have to bear to improve their physical comfort, as well as to support them through these, again, very difficult but normal times of life. So we help with communication and making sure that they have as much information as they want in words that they can understand. We help them with the in a shared way of making these difficult decisions about treatments and looking at the, the, um, whether the return on their investment of time and energy and discomfort in a next round of treatments is going to be, is, is going to return uh, to them the rewards uh, and potential benefits of treatment. Uh, and we help them right through the, the difficult issues of adjusting to a progressive illness, including this stuff that I've termed uh, life completion and closure, which nobody in our society, and frankly nobody even in healthcare, really helps people through. Often people have told us that when it gets to the personal aspects of life, their emotions, their feelings, their hopes, their fears, their disappointments, often they feel almost abandoned by the doctors and nurses that are treating their, their critical conditions or their serious diseases. And, and that's not an indictment of, the, of the, my colleagues here at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. It really is part of the culture of healthcare in the United States. As we've become more scientifically driven and evidence-based and, and frankly powerful as a healthcare system, we've progressively become a disease treatment system. What palliative care represents is a real commitment that frankly Dartmouth-Hitchcock is, is really at the leading edge of of truly person-centered care and family-centered care. And so we get to do that and sort of uh, create further value for patients and families while they're also getting the state-of-the-art disease treatments. What is the makeup of, of your team? It sounds like you might have counselors on your team, people who are trained in talking with patients and families. Well, our team, frankly, all of us are counselors. That's, you know, that's part of the criteria that we uh, seek when we're uh, searching for new 
uh, team members and, and evaluating potential team members. Um, but we have doctors on, on the team specialized in palliative medicine, nurse practitioners also specialized. We have a coordinating nurse. We have a social worker dedicated to our team as well as a, a chaplain or spiritual coordinator. Additionally, um, and somewhat unusual for palliative care services across the country, we have our own cadre of volunteers that we specially select and train and supervise. We call them the no one alone volunteers. And their job, frankly, is to focus on people who are in the hospital, often for lengthy periods of time, and address isolation, loneliness, and boredom. Three factors that can erode people's quality of life and make it harder for them to be in the hospital. I've read statistics that about 20% of Americans die in an intensive care unit and about 75% die in a hospital or in a, in a nursing home. What alternatives do you see to these ways of dying? In fact, in America today, uh, well over 50% of people die in hospitals and about 75 to 80% of people die either in a hospital or a nursing home. Within the hospital, about 40% of people die in ICUs. If you just do the math, that's about 20% of American deaths still today occur in ICUs. There are two things that that, that brings up. First is most people if you ask them eventually where do you where would you like to be during your last days of life pretty much everybody says I'd like to be at home or if I can't be at home in the home of a loved one or in a home like place surrounded by people that I know and I love and who love me okay we ought to be able to deliver on that more than 20 or 30 percent of the time which is about the best that we're doing these days in most communities um, and that takes some preparation and planning. But frankly, I think it's also true that we as a society and culture need to take on redesigning our hospitals and our nursing homes so that they feel like places that if it were the case that our dear mother or father ended up in one of these institutions during the last days of life, we wouldn't cringe. We wouldn't feel guilty. We wouldn't feel like we were uh, abandoning them or, or disappointing them. And there are today, although you know, I, I have great valued colleagues and I have huge respect for the, for the nurses and, and doctors and nurses aides who work in long-term care in nursing homes, today nobody wants to die in a nursing home and nobody wants to send their parents to a nursing home. Um, I think we can reinvent nursing homes. There are uh, models out there uh, that uh, really give us hope that there are enlightened ways to, to design long-term care facilities so that they have really excellent uh, medical components, nursing components, but they're also wonderful places to live and, and where people are nurtured and, and there is life within the nursing home or the, or the long-term care facility. That's a, that's a challenge that uh, we have to hurry to catch up on because we have an aging population. We have a population that increasingly uh, ends life with many m chronic illnesses that used to take us away. You know, traditionally, in earlier times, people would simply die of. Now we get to live with them for many months and often years. That's a good thing. But we have to construct living environments that allow people to enjoy those years. And frankly, for those of us who are, who are um, adults and are uh, in, engaged in parent care, so that we feel good about the places where our parents and grandparents and brothers and sisters uh, may need to be during the last months, weeks, days of life. I, one reflection I had is when my daughter was born, I don't think this was an unusual birth experience in that we had our own room, it was very comfortable, it was a very home-like setting that was really important right. for bringing somebody into life. And it sounds like from what you're saying that we're not doing that on the other end of the life spectrum. We well. are not doing that on the other end of the life spectrum. And we need to be, we can be. In fact, the irony here is that we know that better care during those last months, weeks, days of life 
is actually less expensive than what we're doing now. And yet what we're doing now is often um, not satisfactory to the people we're trying to serve. In fact, many people tell us it was awful. So why aren't we doing this differently? And when you say better care, what, what do you mean by that? Well, this, where people are cared for in a way that honors not only their physiology, but them as a whole person, the emotional, social, even spiritual aspects of this time of human life. I think what, what we've done in the current health system, which as I mentioned is really a disease treatment system, is we see only the diseases and only the problems and, and through the best of intentions, what we do is respond with medical treatment. And so even when we're doing it reasonably well, meaning that we're not making errors and we're treating people's pain, all we've done is fully medicalize the end of life. We've medicalized something that is not a medical experience. It's a personal experience. People who are dying clearly have medical problems, got it. But the experience of dying is not a medical problem to be solved. It is a personal experience for the individual and family. And thus, health care, medicine, nursing, social work, chaplaincy, all of that, has something to offer. We can serve people through the end of life, but we should always remember that first and foremost, this is a personal experience and we are supporting the personal. I say that because usually if somebody becomes seriously ill, they, they get a serious infection, a pneumonia or something of that nature, or they fall and, and have a bad fracture, right? They've fractured their femur. They we bring them to the hospital, and in a sense, what we say, often without even saying it in words, put your life on hold. We got serious things to do here to get you well so that you can get back to your personal life. You're not going to get to that meeting in Chicago. You're going to have to cancel that. You know, but put it on hold. We're going to get you out of here. Things are going to be okay, but for the next week or two, we got to focus on your physical well-being. When people are facing the end of life, you can't say that anymore. And so now, the medical treatment has to, has to support the personal and, and, frankly, be subordinate to the intimate, profoundly important personal experience of, of completing and closing a life. Is it common in your practice to have a patient make a decision that says, I'm deciding not to continue with medical treatment. I would like to, you know, instead of training, instead of trading two more weeks of life or two more months of life in an intensive care unit with a lot of invasive procedures, I'm, I'm going to choose to die in another way. And it, it might mean that I'm here for less, less time, but the, those fewer days that I have are going to be higher quality days? The short answer is yes. When people understand that a disease that they have is progressive, cancer is, is usually the easiest one to talk about, but you could, you could add congestive heart failure or uh, liver disease or some neurologic problem like ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, at some point in time, since we're all mortal and eventually die, at some point in time, more treatment is, is not better care. At some point in time, the disease itself tends to convince people that the quality of life with disease keeps eroding and the burdens of treatment begin to outweigh the potential benefits of treatment. And so because we're mortal, we, we help people to, to um, sort through their options, see what their values are. But in fact, m most people, not all, but most people, even those who want to do whatever they can to live as long as they can, would also say that eventually they want to die gently. Very, very few people want to die on a ventilator in the midst of having CPR performed. So if you're not one of those very rare people who want to die with CPR and uh, on a ventilator, at some point, in order to achieve your goal of dying gently, we have to look at 
when treatments are indicated and will advance what you want and when they would actually be antithetical to what you actually want to achieve. And so that's the work that, that your group does? That's the work that we do day in and day out. How long has the palliative medicine program been here at Dartmouth-Hitchcock? Oh, the palliative care program here at Dartmouth-Hitchcock has, has really existed since about 2000. Um, and it ramped up in, in early 2004. I actually came in December of 2003 with the express uh, uh, charge of uh, expanding and, and uh, really upgrading the, the program here at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Is this part of, is the program here part of a national movement around palliative care? Well, palliative care has been uh, growing dramatically throughout the United States during the last decade or so. And we really are here at Dartmouth-Hitchcock at the forefront of that movement. Um, but yes, there is a national movement. These days, almost all hospitals over 200 beds, and I think pretty much all hospitals over 300 beds, do have some degree of a palliative care program and many smaller hospitals do as well. Uh, ours is more, how can I say this, more comprehensive and more robust than most. And we're, you know, trying to provide a regional and even national example of what authentic team-based palliative care looks like. And frankly, we're publishing research about what the outcomes of palliative care are for the, the patients and families we serve and, and frankly for the health system. In, in general, what are those outcomes telling you? Well, uh, you know, in general, the outcomes make it very clear that people don't have to be in pain during uh, advanced stages of illness. They don't have to uh, feel worried about being breathless or, uh, or suffering from some physical symptoms such as nausea and vomiting or uh, pain. Um, they also uh, can... Um, in feeling better emotionally and feeling better physically, it turns out that they're often able to hang in there and accept more disease treatment. I said before that our healthcare system is really an elegant and powerful disease treatment system. That's a good thing. But we also have to remember that there are people living with these diseases. And so in helping people who are living with a serious illness like cancer or heart failure, making sure that their you know, worries are, are being addressed, that their physical discomforts are being addressed, but also things like that they're getting enough to eat and that, they're, that despite the fact that their appetite may, may be lousy, they're getting enough nutrition. That in attending to the details of helping them to sleep and helping them to get a little bit of activity and exercise, guess what? People feel better physically. You know, that's, that's not rocket science. But we're rediscovering that in the modern era through palliative care research. People do better. If you address their physical comfort and their emotional and social and spiritual well-being, sometimes they actually live longer. You know, it seems funny to, that that fact, the fact that comprehensive palliative care provided cons uh, at the same time that we're providing disease treatments, such as for advanced cancer, actually has a survival advantage, has gotten the attention of the medical community and, frankly, the national press and public. We always knew this. I mean, anecdotally, I know from even my years prior to coming to Dartmouth in my years as a hospice medical director, just by taking meticulously good care of people, sometimes they live longer. It, it's so... It's so um, utterly reasonable, and it makes so much sense, and yet it's been a new finding. You know, it's made headlines. <laughs> has, has that spurred any changes that you've seen? Oh, I think it has spurred changes, although not enough yet. I mean, the fact is that, for instance, a, a, a paper was published a couple of years ago in the New England Journal from Mass General, our colleagues, our palliative care colleagues at Mass General, showing that giving... Uh, team-based palliative care, very much as we do here at Dartmouth-Hitchcock and Norris Cotton Cancer Center. At the same time, you're giving uh, care or treatment for um, advanced lung cancer, creates a survival advantage that's at the same magnitude as drugs like Avastin and Tarceva, which can cost $6,000 or more dollars a month 
and cause bleeding and rashes. We cost a lot less than $6,000 a month and we don't cause bleeding or rashes. And yet the survival advantage was almost three months more for people with fairly late stage lung cancers. Now the good news is that you could also get your Tarceva and Avastin and get palliative care and maybe that survival would be even longer. So that's, you know, that's gotten people's attention and it's beginning um, and I guess we're getting new respect uh, from the uh, oncologists and thankfully from the payers of health care. But there's work to be done. What we haven't done yet, frankly, is we haven't recruited the, uh, or engaged the um, patient base, the, the, the patient groups, the advocacy groups. I hate the term, you know, consumers of health care. But in a certain sense, um, that consumer advocacy is needed. If people knew what I know about the care of their loved ones with advanced illness, they would be demanding the sort of care that we receive here at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, we provide here. Um, they wouldn't accept anything less because from a physiologic perspective, there's no downside. You get to feel better, be a little more active, family gets more support, and you get to live longer. Pretty good. So saying that they would demand these services. Yes, that if they knew what I knew, they would demand the services. And in fact, from a sort of social change perspective, to really reform the healthcare system, we do need that patient and family advocacy, that kind of citizen consumer advocacy, if you will, that is behind every major change in our society. We talked about uh, the birthing movement and how you know, um, w when we baby boomers were having children, we said that the care of our women who are pregnant and through childbirth required expert medical attention, and we demanded expert medical attention. But we also said that the need for health care does not define this as a medical experience. It is first and foremost a personal experience for the individual and family, and it's a normal experience even though it requires health care. Very similar things are needed at this stage of human life. We need to demand, frankly, that our loved ones receive absolutely state-of-the-art medical treatment. But the need for health care does not define this, this time of life we call dying, as a medical experience. It is first and foremost a personal experience for the individual and family that simply requires excellent comprehensive health care. So a, a sea change is needed and it really will require serious sophisticated advocacy on the part of all of us in our society. We can deliver on this, the, the medical schools and the payers and the health care system can deliver this level of care. They really can. We don't need any major breakthroughs. We don't need cold fusion to do this. We got the the, the science and, and the tools that we need today. What we don't have is a system that is really responsive to the real needs of the people it serves. Now I don't have statistics here, but I assume that end-of-life care is a tremendously expensive proposition. Not, not the care that you provide, but once you get into these specialized drugs or people on ventilators and so on and so forth, that, that this is probably an area where a lot of health care dollars are going. Yes, the, the uh, last two years of life probably absorb about two-thirds of Medicaid and Medicare dollars. The last year of life, at least a third of Medicare dollars goes to the last year of life. Now, we're not in this to try to save money, frankly. We're in this to provide the best care possible. That's, that's what we want to do. But because the, the current status quo, if you will, looks at disease and treats disease, frankly, at all costs, unless it becomes utterly futile, which around at an academic medical center like this, it rarely does. There's always a new treatment that might help. Uh, or unless the person says, look, I've looked at the odds and, and, and I've had enough, we continue to provide disease treatment. Well, in this circumstance, you can actually look at matching people's values and preferences to achievable health outcomes. And as people become more ill, 
If you actually have that discussion and ask what matters most now and how can we deliver on this and where do you want to be eventually when it, when it comes your time to leave this life, as we f find that people, as I mentioned before, rarely want to die on a ventilator or in an ICU, they'd rather be at home, we can begin to purely focus on quality, matching their values and preferences with what we can achieve through healthcare. A significant portion of people decide at some point, I don't really need this new round of treatment. I don't need that next MRI because it's not going to change what I do anyway. I really would rather go home and spend time with my spouse or my grandchildren or go to the beach than keep coming back to the uh, hospital for more tests and treatments. And so it turns out the work that we do and the care that we provide, though not cheap by any means, it's expensive because these, the people we care for are ill and require expert treatment. Compared to what would have happened had we not had these conversations, it's significantly less expensive. And so in doing the right thing, we can actually also deliver care that is significantly less expensive than if we didn't exist. This Healthy Highlight is brought to you by Dartmouth-Hitchcock and Ledyard National Bank, working together with our community partners to improve your well-being.